Well, thanks for coming, everyone. It's um, icy out there. No, not too bad. <clears throat> well, what a real pleasure this is to be introducing Ray Shadows. How would I know? Yay! <laughs> so, uh, tonight is uh, stop two of a three stop tour. Last, y yesterday, he gave a press, or was part of a panel in Northampton. And um, here with us tonight, and then tomorrow in Randolph at the uh, Randolph Library. And I bet each evening it will have a different, a little bit different flavor to it. I'm hoping to go up tomorrow night. Um, I want to thank a few people before we get started, and I'll do it really quick. I just want to acknowledge for those of you, with, um, Jane Newton in the back. She's yes. <laughs> Jane has been coming up to the office for three, sometimes three and a half days a week as a, what I, I call that a full-time volunteer. Um, and so if you call the office and there's a, a pleasant, oh, good answers, that would be Jane. I wanted to take a minute to introduce board members. Um, so straight ahead in the middle is Mr. Ned Childs. And, um, it, Ned is in the, 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 wood, the wood business, the cordwood. The, the, he's a woods man. He's out in the woods a lot. Um, uh, Vice President Jake Stewart is in Randolph. He'll be at tomorrow night's event. The uh, treasurer is um, Birgit Johansson, and she lives way over in New Hampshire. She's a farmer, and the uh, treasurer's position is going to transfer, I think, into um, Jim Kirby, a new uh, trustee this year. Um, uh, and Jim has a long history in solar <coughs> energy. Um, clerk is Carol Lemon, clerk and secretary. How many people saw signs on the way in from the side? Well, that was, that was Carol. Thank you, Carol. Uh, and another trustee new this year in the front here is Lori. Do I use your hyphenated name? Just Cartwright. Cartwright. This is Lori Cartwright. And she's an attorney here in downtown Brattleboro. She's not the attorney for the coalition, um, but she's a practicing attorney, and, and that's good stuff to have. Okay, there's enough thank yous, I think. Thank yous and recognitions. My name is Clay Turner. Oh! Yeah. Hey, I, I'm a board member, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it was <laughs> former board member Bill Pearson. Former board member Bill Pearson. Yeah. See, I could go on and on and on. Play. You don't have to think. But I, you know, Pete Newton here. He was at some of the earliest demonstrations. We, how early? Like the first ones. He's a young-looking guy. He was pretty young back then. Well, he, like, like he, the he was a young, young man at the time. And, uh, and he was at the last B-Snap meeting and went home and uh, later said, that felt really good. That felt good yeah. to go and, and put his two cents in. So. All right. Ray Shattis. I, I could have spent, I could spend a long, long time giving an introduction to Ray, but I won't do that now. Uh, we're just going to move on to the film. I think, do you want to say a few words, Ray, before we yeah. start the film? Yeah, you need to introduce yeah, the sure. film. Yeah. Um, yeah, boy, I didn't make a long list to talk about Ray. Uh, this person, really, it's a gift for us to have him here tonight. Um, and my spin is he's going to share some information, and then it's, it's up to us to do something with it. I mean, I truly feel that way. That's why I'm here. I really regularly say I would much rather be doing something else and something I'm more suited to. Um, <laughs> God knows, this, I, I do have some shortcomings uh, up in the office. Um, it goes for all of us, Clay. Yeah. Um, so. I mentioned he's been, he's been on the board since 1980. And then there's Ray Shadows, who's yep. been on the board since 1982. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's applaud for that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you ready? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Let's get you can fill in any gaps that he Now, I'm just going to say that, that um, Clay has been the number one person uh, that I've relied on since about 2006. Uh, he's been holding the coalition together and doing the, doing the spade work. Um, and um, so whatever little bit we've accomplished would not have been accomplished if Clay hadn't been in. That's it. <laughs> Say what? So if you're going to talk for a few minutes. If you want to walk around, put the little box in your pocket. I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> Start pacing. And plant the tracking yeah. chip in here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, thanks for coming out on a, what we in Maine call a fairly crappy night like this. <laughs> I think you're going to find this video entertaining, and especially if you have, you know, any uh, Inspector Clouseau, Pink Panther kind of sensibility about videos, because because this was done by Russian guys who, you know, they landed on an alien planet and talked to people in an alien language, and they put together a story, and and. <coughs> And like most Russians, they're completely unconscionable. They, they borrowed, <laughs> they borrowed. We had, we had wonderful times with a big debate about whose officials were stupider, the American or the Russian. <laughs> it's just, anyway, they're, they're wonderful people. They put together this fairly wacky thing. And um, it was supposed to be, when they say decommission a plant, they mean shut it down and decommission. They don't, use, they don't go like, let's shut down a nuclear plant. This thing is steaming away over there and they go, let's decommission it. So <clears throat> it, covers the, it, it covers the gamut. The contest in Maine, re, I mean, there was opposition to building the plant in Maine. Just, I mean, very, very smart people put together wonderful propaganda and full page things and pamphlets and booklets and they were on, you know, and they did a great job of opposing it. And so whatever we did was six years after the plant started operation was on the shoulders of giants. You know, the people that went ahead of us, uh, all the information was brand new then. All of it. And so, uh, and also the, the patriotic fervor behind getting ahead of the Russians and building these damn things, you know. It was like, I mean, it was the end of the 1960s, you know, that they were citing Vermont Yankee. So they did a great job, and uh, the watershed moment for us uh, was the accident at Three Mile Island, you know. And I called the Atomic Energy Commission, only to find out it no longer existed and was now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I talked to this guy and he sounded like an astronaut. He was, he was totally smooth and cool and had all the technical stuff at hand. He was very friendly and he was the NRC guy. And I said, how do I find out more? Because I was really quite exercised about having a plant a mile and a half upwind of our just budding organic farm and, and our five kids at the time. And it, so <clears throat> he said every, every nuclear plant has uh, in, the, in the host town or the near, nearby town a public document room. It's at the public library and he looked it up and he said yours is in the town of Wiscasset, Maine and that's where we put all the documents. And I went over there and found out that they had had a recent large release, a uh, couple thousand gallons of primary coolant. This is the stuff that circulates through the reactor, had been dumped on the floor because of uh, failure of some seal uh, on a valve. 
these are not little valves, these are big valves. And uh, the, the top section of the valve, there is a, a flange and a seal, and then the bottom section, and that had failed. It, it, so this stuff shot out. It was under 2,000 pounds of pressure, so it's understandable. And uh, it released a cloud of uh, a radioactive isotope, iodine-131. That's the one that goes to your thyroid. Uh, and at the time, they had the vents open on the big, <coughs> super big um, containment, and this cloud blew out into the neighborhood. And um, they didn't have the monitors working, so they they basically had a, a cloud of gas that they es estimated at so many hundreds, I think it was 1,200 or 1,300, whatever, uh, cubic feet per second going out, and they had no way to measure how much radiation that was. So ultimately, we had thyroid scans done of all the local school children. Another nuclear outfit, uh, one that prevented the building of a nuclear plant further down the coast intervened and so we had these scans and the kids were all right. The iodine and the seaweed, <coughs> you know, people chew seaweed to get iodine, you know that? Yeah. Well, anyway, so the, that was that was through the roof uh, in, the, in the whole bay. And anyway, that got us, it got our attention, it got us started, it taught us that um, getting the information real information is all important. We had the documents. We had them from the public document room. <coughs> we had them cut. Here was the evidence. Then we could go to our officials and say, what the hell? So, you know, that was, that was the beginning of it. Anyway, the Russian documentary goes back to the 1979-1980 era when we had a um, citizen initiative referendum in Maine. We're one of five states east of the Mississippi that has those populist kind of uh, provisions in our constitution. And we're allowed to propose a law and get it voted on and it sticks. So, I mean, it's a binding vote. So we did that. When the plant was six years old, we took 41.9% of the vote. The nuclear industry and everybody waited in, everybody from Westinghouse to Whirlpool. Um, to Bechtel, to name it. Um, they spent a million plus dollars on top of the table. We don't know how much under. We raised about $600,000. Um, went for an 18-month campaign. The United Press International, UPI, remember those guys? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we used to get them confused with UPS, and we'd say, no, 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 we don't want any packages. So... <laughs> But anyway, they, they said basically that had the campaign lasted another four or five weeks, we would have won. Because that was it. That was the challenge. So anyway, the Russians pick up there. You know, they, they don't sort the stuff out too good. They jumped from there in uh, 79 to 1995 when Maine Yankee was in big trouble. Um, a whistleblower out of Yankee Atomic Engineering, uh, Yankee Nuclear Services Division, said that they had falsified um, calculations about how well the reactor could handle heat and what that heat would be um, in the event of an accident. So it, that was the beginning of an investigation. Um, when the investigation was over, NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, said everything's fine, but there were 3,300 maintenance items in arrears, some of them more than 10 years old. Um, the, the containment, this is the massive, I don't know how thick it is at the base, it must be five or six feet thick, with rebar this big around. And, and every several inches, this is a massive structure, had been built too small. The industry guys had forgotten to calculate the reduction in the volume of that containment um, 
in the event of an accident, you see, they're pouring water on the reactor and into the reactor, and water's pouring out of it, and they're pouring water, and the water fills up in the bottom of the containment. Water is not compressible. You, you can't squish water, and, and so it takes up the volume, the space in the reactor, and then if you have high-pressure steam release, you don't have enough space to absorb the shock, so you lose the reactor. This is like one of those insoluble problems, you know. It's like having, it's like having rotting pipes underground at Vermont Yankee. It's like having rotting cooling towers, you know, ready to fall down. It's like having undersized transformers that are fritzing out. It's like having cracks in a steam dryer at Vermont Yankee. Or, you know, the problems go on and the costs go up and the company has to figure out what to do with it. So the Russians kind of jumped from 79 to 95. For lack of anybody with real star quality, they really focused on my activity in it, you know. I was the negotiator. I was the person that was the point man for our environmental groups, and I was the one to talk Turkey with um, the main Yankee Atomic Power Company. There's some photographs. Uh, they're, they're almost stills from the, from the movie that we put up on the door back there. And uh, there's one with me shaking hands there lower left with the president of uh, Maine Yankee Atomic Power Company, where they have just deeded over 200 acres of saltwater farm plus a couple hundred thousand dollars for a startup on a, a nonprofit willing to undertake community dialogue on environmentally sensitive issues. You know, and, and th that's where we were. Um, we gained a lot. We'll talk about it later, maybe, if you want to, to get the details. And Clay has some uh, printouts. You know, these are the things we gained through negotiation. Um, this is all... This is all the, the best stuff that you're taught when you're little kids about accommodating the other fellow, recognizing their rights, respecting them, um, insisting on your rights. Um, it's all the good stuff of negotiating with, with people that you oppose. And, and um, I'm, I'm recommending that we get in tune with that um, for the coming uh, discussions over decommissioning. Um, we're at the end of the rope <clears throat> at the Vermont Public Service Board. We have like, <laughs> we have this much room to wiggle to try to get some conditions in there on having a good decommissioning. You know, and over here is the governor negotiating. I don't know if he knows what the hell he's talking about. I don't think so. But he's negotiating away. He's going to come up with a package. It's going to come to the Vermont Public Service Board. We're going to have a go around. It's going to be over. From that point forward, <clears throat> there is no... Um, verifiable, uh, subject to the adjudicatory test of truth, on oath kind of um, interaction until, and this is at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, until two years, until a minimum of two years, it's kind of a backwards calculation, before they hand the license back to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission before it's all over. They have to file a, what's called a license termination plan, but they don't have to do it until two years before they've finished decommissioning. So in between time, they have to, they have to put out a little um, post-shutdown decommissioning activities report. The one at Connecticut Yankee was 25 pages, Maine Yankee was 50 pages, it was just uh, public relations crap, it, there wasn't any content. Uh, but they have to put out that, and there is an opportunity for a public meeting, you can go down and NRC will let you come up to the microphone and 
say what you got to say, and then they will promptly ignore it exactly. and do whatever the hell they want, and there's no recourse. <coughs> doesn't matter. If their decision is totally arbitrary, the term that lawyer guys like to use, totally arbitrary and capricious, like <coughs> off the wall, so what? There's nothing you can do about it. The next meeting um, w would be about, uh, who knows, somewhere in the middle of the process. Could be five years, could be ten. That is if they do this safe star thing. Um, and that's called the decommissioning plan. Now they make a larger plan for decommissioning, and they will have public meetings again. But they're not on oath. Nobody is testifying is on oath. Nobody cares. There's nothing you can do. It can be just total public relations BS and it's over. So, you know, the, the, I'm saying this because what we're doing right now at the Vermont Public Service Board is quite likely the last opportunity in a Vermont state legal forum to hold them accountable for what they say and to you know, wrestle with them over the terms of, of decommissioning. One last couple of quick sentences. And it will start to fill in and I'll go next door and take a nap and then you wake me in the <laughs> And keep your sense of humor, folks. The, <clears throat> from today until the last quarter of uh, 2014, Vermont Yankee is in the most dangerous period, day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, of its entire 41 year life. This is very, very serious because you know, there are two, there are essentially two elements that go into nuclear safety. One is human performance, and the other is the integrity of the equipment that they use. Okay. Something breaks. Let's say it's a divorce. Let's say somebody gets loaded up on pills and whatever, and they're not paying attention, you know, so that's a human performance thing. Something breaks. Let's say it's a, a, a vital control on the reactor. And we had a number of those incidents at Vermont Yankee. You know, we don't pay much attention to them because we don't understand these little switches and solenoids and stuff and what turns something on or off, you know, but believe me, it's critical. It's critical because because everything in the reactor must be constantly balanced. The amount of heat that the fuel is putting out, the amount of water that is flowing through the fuel, the, the uh, boiling of that water. We have these things called jet pumps on them, and they wipe away the bubbles so that we can keep a, a certain amount of reactivity going on to maintain the reactor power. And so. Everything, everything, all the way through down to the turbine that spins the generator and back, everything must be balanced, okay? And, and they do, they, they have different terms for it. The one I like most is the balance of power. But it's very, very sensitive. So, not only must the equipment work, and this is equipment that's, that's now gone beyond its design life, you know, you expect stuff to start breaking down toward the end of its design life. This has gone beyond its design life. It's also being operated at 120% of its original license thermal power, which means that the reactor is putting out, it's not that much hotter, but it's putting out that much more heat to boil that much more water, to make that much more steam, and shove it through the turbines um, so that they crank out that much more horsepower and that much more electricity. Um, 120% on a reactor past the end of its design life. Just because the executives go to the legislature and say, we're going to shut down at the end of next year. You know, they said the final quarter 2014, so that's basically a year away. We're going to shut down at the end of the year. That doesn't mean that those components are under less stress or that those components are 
um, are that the aging phenomena has stopped. No, it goes on at the same rate as physics dictates it. It's what it is. So it's much more dangerous in that aspect, and worse than that, um, the morale of the workers. The workers have to pay close attention. They can't screw around. <coughs> they cannot, as they used to do, put slides from their vacation in the emergency slide here, or they can't read comic books, they can't take drugs, they can't monkey around at all. They have to pay attention. And to do that, you need high morale, just like the military service or something. You've got to be gung-ho, you've got to be on the point, you've got to want to do it. These guys have been told it's all over in a year. The best and the brightest are pretty much gone already. Um, and the few that remain are leaving soon um, because there's a great demand. The nuclear engineering schools have not produced graduates in a long time in any numbers. There's a great demand for those workers. They know their job's over in a year. They're gone. The ones that remain are the ones that can't get jobs away, or maybe they don't want to move because they like living around here. And they are demoralized. And a lot of them are probably, instead of reading their safety manuals, they're reading want ads, looking for a job somewhere. You know, it's a real tough situation for them. It's almost impossible for the company to maintain the kind of morale that you need to run a nuclear plant. So on those two bases, the, the physical degradation of the plant and the moral decline, morale decline, I say it's, it is the most <coughs> dangerous time ever. And so anything that we can do to stimulate the regulators to pay closer attention, to look over their shoulder, anything we can do to look over their shoulder to let NRC know that people are watching. NRC is a funny animal. I dealt with them a long time. If they know people are watching, and if they are caught doing a crappy job and it becomes public, they, it's like, it's like um, right, honor among thieves or something, falling out among thieves. They will take it out on the licensee. And, and so, in other words, they will snap the whip and the licensee has to respond. And so that's, that's kind of what you want. Um, right now, um, New England Coalition, there are other organizations working on this, and they're doing good work. But New England Coalition right now is the only one that's in head, head the heels, with, in lock, stock, and barrel. You know, we're, we're totally committed to pressuring NRC, pressuring the state regulators, to make certain that this last year is not any more dangerous than, uh, than it can be. Um, and um, we're intervening. We, we met, Clay and I went to D.C. in July, and we <coughs> met with the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The chairman and the NRC are concerned about something very important in all this, and it's a source of great danger, and it's the only way to put it. And that is the storage of spent nuclear fuel. Right now, as you know, every fuel assembly that's ever been irradiated at that plant is stored in a, in a six or seven story spent fuel pool. And it needs to be moved into dry cask where it isn't all in one mass and where the loss of coolant, loss of water around it uh, won't potentially set it um, to smoldering. It's, it's, uh, they don't burst into flame like they say in the papers. But the fuel burns like your outdoor you know, charcoal pit, um, and you can't put it out once it gets going. And because there are at least five reactor cores, it's, the potential consequences are at least five times worse than the classic meltdown. The NRC has um, reports on this. I worked on one, I love it. But the tables that are in it, they, they indicate the potential for 25,000 latent cancer deaths out to 500 miles. That's the kind of language they use. I mean, 
I don't know what the possibilities of that are. I think re relatively slim. But NRC, you know, the regulator, they ran the calculations out that far. So that danger, it, it carries over. It, it's present now in the reactor now. This reactor is, is vulnerable to um, seismic events. Uh, NRC's experts say that um, it could tear from corner to corner in the event of a, a strong seismic wave, or the bottom could drop out. Uh, yes, sir. In which case, there'd be no shielding for the fuel you couldn't get within a half a mile of it, so you're not going to come and put water on it. Water wouldn't help anybody once it gets burning because um, it only adds, it breaks down and it adds hydrogen and oxygen separately to the flames. So it's, it's serious. Um, you know, I don't know, I may have a stroke any minute, in which case that's the more serious problem for me. <laughs> or, or given my driving, you know, I might not make it from here to West Brattleboro where I'm staying tonight. So there's risk and there's risk. But in terms of that plant, this is a big risk. Um, that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, again, the film is uh, quite creative. Mostly, I think, for my, what I want to get across in the, in the movie is the involvement of people, the effect they can have on a nuclear company, uh, on a power plant like Vermont Yankee. Um, yeah, those two things. We had a lot of people working on it, and, um, and we did good, and we feel very proud of that. Um, and I would like to transfer as much of that as possible uh, here, that you could pick and choose what do you want to do with your community, uh, and what are you willing to put into it, and then so that's it. And there's a burning question over here. Yeah, uh, from, from, from our standpoint, what is the safest method of decommissioning? Was it decon? Is it uh, greenfield? Is it safe store? What, what uh, for this plant, what, what, what uh, well, <coughs> it's seven years and then, and then three years to take it down? Or? Here's, what, here's what we found at Main Yankee, and it has to do the company, this is like the company bill. This is not Ray's idea, okay? Main Yankee looked at it and they said it was cheaper, cost less, to do uh, prompt decommissioning. Their, their motto was green or clean, I forget which, in seven years. And it actually took seven and a half years. And in, when we did our, our initial report, the post-shutdown decommissioning activities report, I have a transcript at home. You know, and at that point, Main Yankee was saying, "Well, if you do prompt decommissioning, you're going to have the old timers there, and they know where the uh, skeletons are buried, and they're going to say, don't cut into that wall.' You know, mm -hmm. the pipe behind it. You know, we had this contamination event, and so on. So they all know the plant in intimate detail, and you can prevent a lot of radiation exposures because that was initially the NRC said." Safe Star is okay because, hey, look, some of these radionuclides, you know, they drop half their power in five years or 12 years, you know. And so if you wait 20 years or so, they'll be reduced by that much. The energy will have dissipated. But many Yankee figured they could offset that by, by using smarts. As it turned out, this was, the main Yankee plant was the first really large-scale nuclear decommissioning to be completed in the United States. Pretty much everything they were doing was brand new to them, you know. And energy, energy is a, in some ways a very, very bad plant, very, very bad operator, but in other ways they're aggressive and they're creative. Mostly they're creative about their testimony and they're creative <laughs> about, about how you follow the rules. But they're also creative in other ways. And, and what the engineers did there was they, they gave the plant's plumbing a dose of drain. It wasn't drain, it was acid, actually. 
Grano would produce what's called mixed waste. You don't want to do that. They used acid and they etched the inside of the reactor plumbing out. They took off uh, a couple of millimeters from the inside of everything. That took all that radiation into solution, all the radioactive material into solution. They filtered that and they shipped that waste in a block, in sealed pack containers, to storage at Barnwell, uh, South Carolina. And there, what they do is they dig big holes in the ground. They plunk all these containers in, they put a piece of plastic over it, and they cover it, and they hope for the best. However, that engineered storage which is a little different than having a leaking nuclear plant. We have some, we have some photographs floating around of, uh, of valves, underground valves, at uh, Indian Point One, which has been in safe store for more than 20 years, and they're all corroded to hell and leaking. We know about leaking at Vermont Yankee. So we have that consideration. The other thing they did is they, they put a high-pressure jet rotating gizmo right inside the reactor and they use a mixture of garnet which is like what you have in sandpaper and high pressure water and they went around and around and inside that reactor and I think they took off more than an eighth of an inch of all the metal inside there and gathered and filtered and shipped that. Mm -hmm. Is it a Yankee took, at, took it around? This was at Maine Yankee. I have no idea of um, you know, I, I do know that Connecticut Yankee was a completely screwed up decommissioning. Um, but this is what this is what they did. They they, they aggressively pursued this. You know, and the trade off, you know, is the fact that you're shipping more of this nasty material to some place that may or may not want it. And then you have to measure is it is it, is it more environmentally responsible, better site or not, you know. And that's going to be part of the debate. I guess. <coughs> but they reduced the radiation dose to the workers um, and to the general environment and to the public to way, way below the allowable dose uh, that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has in, in regulation. So... <coughs> Ultimately, we were able to reduce the site, be very, very clean, relatively safe, um, and, and the workers came out ahead as far as dose was concerned. Uh oh, another question. <laughs> Would you could you please shut up? That's a good question. All right. <laughs> Ask me, and I'll. I don't know how to phrase that one as a question. <laughs> Two very quick questions. First one is, I know that Maine Yankee was, was decommissioned in seven to eight years. Is it possible to do it any faster than that? Probably not, because, so. well, here's the thing. We got uh, all the spent fuel that's out there in the spent fuel pool that's been there for five years or so can all be put into dry sand. But the fuel that's recently removed, anything up to five years, you have to wait for it to cool off. So, so, and the best place to do that is in the spent fuel pool. So you're not going to take that apart just for like five years. Also, you can isolate it. Maine Yankee did. They're going to have to do it. It's very expensive. You, you need to s s cut all the plumbing and all the wiring, all the everything off of that spent fuel pool and put in new stuff to keep it separate from the reactor because you're going to be working on the reactor. So, you know, it really does push it. It pushes all the work toward the end of that five to seven years. The spent fuel casks that Vermont Yankee has are much better designed than the ones at Maine Yankee. These casks have a tube that goes up the middle of the canister that the fuel's in, and it, it forms a thermal siphon so that 
cool stuff is sucked in the bottom and it heats up and it's blown out the top and down onto the fuel again. It circulates the coolant, the helium coolant in there. And that allows you to put hotter fuel in. Maybe that these could go in three years. I'm not sure. All right. Clay wants to start the film. One, one quick question. Go right ahead. Um, well, you, you were talking about Maine Yankee and, and when they got caught with those corrupted codes. Yeah. But the NRC said that's, that was okay. Well, wait. But the, but the fait accompli, if I heard you correctly, was when they found that there was this engineering problem with the... Th Many engineering problems, yeah. Well, how did that become public, that, about the, about the uh, inability of the, the containment? Undersized part of the containment was that... um, uh, John Zwolinski was one of the managers at, from NRC, and he basically let us know that in a, in a stand-around so BS session. So it was session the we NRC having. that actually revealed that... that That's right. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Interesting. Although not officially, but we had, like... You know, and so then it ultimately became official because of the the equivalent of an NRC whistleblower. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was the one. That was the that was that was enough to do it. Yeah, yeah. And and NRC, you know, I mean, I paid them bad because I don't like them, but they it's a mixed it's a mixed situation. You have people there that really want to do the job. I think they're in the minority, and then you have others that don't care, and then you have some that are pretty much working for the industry. And usually that, that goes up this way, so that the top management is suppressing the, the yeah. inspectors and so on. It's the way it works. And, yeah. you know, but we had... Eric, would you make one correction? Earlier you had said all of the rods that they've irradiated are in the fuel pool. pool. Well, there's, yeah, we have 12 casts or something loaded. They're, they're all right there. They haven't left sight. 13. Okay. Thank you, right? Thank you, right? 13. Thank you. Right. Thank you. In any large struggle, it cannot be won if people only give out of their surplus. Someone must give out of their substance. Ray Shaddis to Maine. We were young and had young children and we moved out into the country in a little farm that was very rough and our, our idea was to live close to the land. From where I'm sitting here in the in the backyard of my farm, uh, Maine Yankee, the site is about three kilometers from here and it is also the prevailing wind comes this way, comes to us. But when it was under construction, we moved to this farm. From the time that we were young, very young, to the time that we were in school, we were always idealistic together and having ideas of doing things in a different way and kind of really partners in what we're doing. So in that respect, in that respect, it was a natural thing to do, you know. And we could hear the sound of the construction equipment on site and they had a um, speaker system so we could hear them paging workers making announcements came right to us it let us know how close that plant was to our farm we were there for probably a number of years and it was just to the point where we were getting everything we had some animals we had our children were healthy everything was beautiful and three mile island happened in west in uh, pennsylvania on march 28 1979 
a pump in the secondary cooling loop at the Three Mile Island nuclear power station failed. Within two hours, the water level in the reactor dropped so low that the top of the reactor core was left exposed and began to melt. After two and a half hours, warning systems first registered increased radiation levels at the station. After nine hours, hydrogen gas that had accumulated in the containment building exploded. By then, about one-third of the fuel core had melted. The amount of radioactivity released into the atmosphere was estimated to be between 2.5 and 13 million curies. Cleanup operations began in 1979 and were officially completed in 1993. They cost nearly one billion U.S. dollars. At that moment, it just really was so clear how all of that beautiful family, all that beautiful farm was at risk because right across the river was the main Yankee plant. With Three Mile Island, we lost all confidence in the safety of the main Yankee plant. And when we investigated, we found a series of incidents that showed us that it was poorly run, poorly managed, poorly maintained. I remember the day that we made the decision to do something, and it was really, on the one hand, it was hard because we knew it was going to change everything in our lives, but on the other hand, So my wife and I, uh, we talked over this threat. Our conclusion was that because of releases that had happened at the plant, because of strontium-90, uh, the radioactive isotope showing up in local milk samples, our conclusion was they are poisoning the earth. So we naturally almost decided to take it to a town meeting kind of format. Cindy Fisher, whom I believe you've spoken with, and myself, started, got on the phone and started calling everybody we could think of, asking them to call other people and other people, and uh, got together a meeting. I did not believe it to be a safe uh, or long-term healthy uh, way to create power and um, I know that a lot of my initial reaction was instinctual and it still is. Construction of the Maine Yankee nuclear power plant on Bailey Point Peninsula near the town of Wiscasset, Maine was completed in 1972. With its 900 megawatt reactor, the plant was once the largest power producer in the state. Maine's economy is primarily based on commercial fishing, trade, tourism, and forestry. Its beautiful coastline attracts many visitors from the U.S., Canada, and Europe who come to taste the state's famous lobsters. Maine Yankee is located outside Wiscasset, a town with a population of 3,700 that stretches along the Sheepscot River. A so-called emergency planning zone covers the area within a 25-mile radius of the plant and includes 15 towns in two states. Edgecombe, hometown of Ray Shattis, is one of them. At the time, the population here was 700 people. April of 1979, um, on a very rainy uh, Thursday night, we had around a thousand people that came to that meeting. When I was 15 years old, my mother took me to Boston as a special trip. It was during that awful time when Hiroshima was bombed, and I saw pictures of hurt, hurt people and I swore to myself, never, never nuclear power. Many years later, of course, Betty and I worked in the monitoring network and we saw around Maine Yankee nuclear power plant, a higher rate of leukemia than the rest of the state. 
In college, David Hall majored in nuclear physics, so when he was drafted into the Army, he worked in the Radiation Monitoring Corps. I think it all started with Three Mile Island, when a lot of us gathered at the Town Hall in Edgecombe, and that started the movement at getting Maine Yankee shut down. The Citizens Monitoring Network was also formed, and I was on the citizen, I've been a member of the Citizens Monitoring Network, and I also was one of the regional leaders of at that time, decimeters were not available for purchase by the general public in the U.S., and so David came up with a design for such a device. He found people who could build it and asked them for help. And we were able to produce a measuring instrument for $40, and quite a few of us got these measuring instruments, and so we could, it would alarm if the radiation got above certain levels. And there were instances where they did get above certain levels and we kept records of what the radiation was doing. And we worked with a physician who was a geneticist who did a study with us to show that it actually happened. This irritated certain managers at Maine Yankee. The Karen Silkwood, you know, you know about Karen Silkwood? She was a, um, an activist who had information, inside information, and she was run off the road. I mean, she was, she was murdered, I think. Um, uh, and she was, she was forced off the road um, in, in the dark on her way home. And so we, 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 were, we were pretty nervous. We were. Uh, we were frightened. And we were not harassed. No. Uh, mm -hmm. No, we were not. The worst thing that happened to me personally was someone put a snake in my mailbox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lawyer friend who was staying here on the farm, we have a little cabin in the woods and he was staying there, came and he said, so we protested. So what? You know, we made noise. It was in a newspaper. So what? Now what are you going to do? And he said, you should have a referendum. According to Maine's Constitution, citizens have the right to propose new laws, which are then voted on in statewide referendums. A committee to shut down Maine Yankee via referendum was organized. Ray Shaddis and his wife Patricia led the campaign. When we, we collected the signatures, it took several months, and a vote was scheduled for September 1980. My wife and I worked full-time on that campaign for that vote. Uh, we had no savings. We had little money coming in. My wife was working as a waitress in the restaurant, but not much money. We had this six children, too feed and take care of and we put everything into that. I had come to believe that in any large struggle it cannot be won if people only give out of their surplus. They must, someone must give out of their substance. The farm was still needed to be cared for and the children of course so that was a little challenging but it was it was something that I was very much, I was very much in favor of, you know. I am, first of all, an artist. This is my work. So in, in a way, uh, what you do informs how you do things when you become an activist, if you, if you take up a cause. One of our other board members, Friends of the Coast board members, a good friend of mine, Lucy, got the idea because we are artists and we know so many artists to use art to fundraise uh, for Friends of the Coast in our work at Maine Yankee. We found a location on a beautiful coastal estate. We uh, rented a huge white uh, tent for the event. 
they got the folding chairs, we got the auctioneer, and a few hundred works of art. Um, and the organization uh, netted something in the area of $24,000 to go into our cause in that one event. The U.S. nuclear industry and Wall Street bankers and investors joined forces with major corporations and raised millions of dollars to torpedo the main referendum. And in the end um, of that referendum, 42%, uh, 41.9% to be precise, of the voters voted to close the plant. In this area, within, a, within the emergency planning zone, the large majority of people voted to close the plant. Taxes paid by Maine Yankee amounted to 95% of the Wiscasset municipal budget. This money paid for the local school, the fire department, road construction, maintenance, and sewerage. First up, of course, they did not want the plant shut down, ever. I mean, it would be the equivalent of shooting your milk cow. They didn't, no way. So they were very supportive of the plant, no matter what. In the town where the plant is, the town got 95%, more than 95% of its taxes from the plant for property tax. Even there, one-third of the voters voted to close the plant. Bill Thompson was one of the leaders of the organization Friends of the Coast. As a manager in a large company, he had good connections with industrial top management. The incidence of breast cancer in Lincoln County, which we live, is about twice what it is elsewhere in the state what its cause might be. I was personally involved because my wife was then suffering for breast cancer, and it's a question of whether that was related to our living here as opposed to some other source. It was then that the public monitoring network began to gather statistics on rates of cancer and other diseases among people living in the vicinity of Maine Yankee. Custom-made decimeters installed around the plant would send alarm signals when high radiation levels were recorded. Mike McCannum catches lobsters. He lives in a hamlet called Booth Bay and fishes in the Sheepscot River, whose estuary is a perfect habitat for lobsters and various species of fish. Since 1983 I've been fishing here and uh, when Maine Yankee became active, we didn't at the time pay much attention. In 1974, the Maine Yankee and the state sampling, radiation sampling team, they found radiation in a few lobsters in 1974. Mike joined Friends of the Coast when he heard about the rupture of pipes in the steam generator at Maine Yankee. This incident troubled a lot of locals. The personal motivation was my family's health and safety and, uh, and my uh, livelihood, my income. If the uh, radiation uh, became bad, uh, my house, as the crow flies, as the bird flies, is 2.5 miles from here. Christopher Dorothy moved to Maine in 1979. A builder by trade, his concern over environmental damage compelled him to join Friends of the Coast. Atlantic Ocean is this way. Nuclear power plant, Maine Yankee, would be approximately, probably, 12 miles that way, plus or minus. And I got several tours of the place, having friends also who work there. So I got to see firsthand the pool with the cooling rods and the turbine in the building and all the wires underneath. And and, uh, I don't know, questioned what was going on there. Annie Burt, a local resident, was also active in Friends of the Coast. Our group of citizens, which may I say was a small group, we were not large in number, but we made a lot of noise. We did several activities to keep people mindful the plant that was in their midst. We uh, participated 
in a uh, parade down in Booth Bay Harbor. We had children with uh, wreaths of roses in their hair. We carried our Friends of the Coast um, banner and threw atomic fireball candies out to the crowd. They expect to get candies. In April 1995, Maine Yankee was shut down after steam generator pipes ruptured. And that April, their public relations team decided they would have an Earth Day celebration at the plant. I lost it. I couldn't... To me, that was a great insult to Earth Day. And so we had an Earth Day rally ourselves back at the Edgecombe Town Hall. This time we only had maybe a few hundred people. A 10% increase in reactor output above permissible levels at Main Yankee produced additional stress on the narrow diameter pipes in which superheated water from the reactor circulated. The stress load was so high that they ruptured. This incident set off a whole chain of failures and events that alerted the general public to safety problems at the plant. In December 1995, the Union of Concerned Scientists received a letter written by an employee at Maine Yankee who disclosed numerous deficiencies in its safety system. This anonymous letter opened a Pandora's box over safety at Maine Yankee. Friends of the Coast collected hundreds of signatures on a petition asking Maine's governor to launch a thorough investigation of Maine Yankee. An inspection carried out by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission not only confirmed the allegations made by the anonymous informer, but also uncovered numerous safety violations and defects in the plant's design. In June 1996, Maine Yankee conducted its own detailed analysis of plant operations, which revealed low morale amongst employees and unsafe operating procedures. In November 1996, the plant's main computer was shut down for 41 hours, which led to a total loss of control over certain sections of the plant. In January 1997, the plant reactor was shut down when a leak from the fuel assemblies was detected. The purging of gases from the containment building led to abnormally high releases of radioactivity. On August 6, 1997, the 18 members of Maine Yankee's board of directors voted to terminate operations. Maine Yankee's owners thus announced its closure 11 years before the plant's operating license was due to expire. Dan Thompson was head of Wiscasset's town planning department for 13 years. This was a significant surprise and stress on the community. Most of us expected the plant to operate for at least another 10 years. Initial reactions were anger. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the main Department of Environmental Protection had no clear plan for decommissioning the plant. There were no regulations in place that govern this procedure. Mike Meissner is a nuclear engineer. Throughout the process of decommissioning Maine Yankee, he was its president and chief nuclear officer. That when Maine Yankee shut down, while there were a few other large-scale commercial nuclear power plants that had also been shut down, no one in the U.S. had done a decommissioning for a full-scale a full scale, uh, nuclear power plant. So uh, we were the first to really do a decommissioning. The challenges then were the fact that uh, there was no precedent. When the plant was shut down, the second telephone call that the president of the company made was to me. And the topic of discussion was creating an advisory panel of citizens to be a, a go-between between the community, the citizens at large, and the company. During the final two years of its operations, the public, the media, and politicians closely monitored everything that happened at Maine Yankee. This resulted in a loss of public trust in nuclear power plants. To make sure the decommissioning of Maine Yankee went smoothly, the process had to be made transparent to the public. We wanted a, a good deal of input and uh, 
from the community and we pledged to provide the community as much information as we had both our plans and the uh, technical aspects of decommissioning. Main Yankee requested the support of state authorities in establishing a community advisory panel on decommissioning. Don Hudson was the panel's vice chair from the moment it was formed. Dr. Hudson is president of Chiwanki Foundation, and the governor appointed him to represent the interests of the environmental protection community on the panel. I believe that the, sh the mere presence of, the, of this public body listening to the company, listening to the government, create, helped to create, not entirely on its own, but helped to create an atmosphere that allowed uh, Ray and his group much better access to information. When we started our community advisory panel, I really wanted Ray to sit on that panel because w w we needed some different voices. The main Yankee Atomic Power Company asked if our group, Friends of the Coast, could appoint a representative to that panel, even though we were anti-nuclear. The main Yankee Community Advisory Panel on Decommissioning held its first public session on August 21st, 1997 two weeks after the decision to shut down the plant was announced. On the very first meeting, we declared that th there could be no process that was valid unless all the information regarding the decommissioning would be on the table, open, made public. That had previously not been shared. Mm -hmm. And I believe that as the result of being in this public space, the company was truly obliged to respond positively, and they did. Mike Selman, who was on the community advisory panel, said, sure. And, you know, we began this, this dialogue with Friends of the Coast, where Mr. Shaddis would come to the plant and sit and meet with engineers, and, and I think the company was really quite open with the documents that, uh, that he was interested in seeing. Uh, so it was a way to establish uh, a certain level of trust and transparency in the process, and that was just one example. During the first months of the decommissioning process, Maine Yankee gave panel members access to documents that had previously been restricted to internal use. Okay. Each drawer, these documents were not just Maine Yankee, but every nuclear plant in the United States. At present, three of the 16 reactors that have been shut down in the U.S. are in standby mode, but the actual decommissioning of these facilities has been postponed. Given my experience, my view is it's much better to do it right away, once, right after you shut down, uh, for several reasons. Uh, you have your skilled workers there. You want to take advantage of them. They know the, the facility, they know the plant, they know the area. But for us, it was a clear-cut issue of do it now, keep your best people, return the site to a productive use. According to preliminary estimates, Maine Yankee needed around $500 million to complete decommissioning. And as it turned out, if you exclude unexpected items that came up during the decommissioning or new regu regulations that required cost, came in almost right on that $500 million. Since the decommissioning of Maine Yankee was begun well before its operating license expired, the company had not saved enough money for it. To raise the necessary funds, a decision was made to increase electricity rates. We intervened there. We said, they're not entitled to it. The plant is being shut down because of poor management. You cannot reward poor management with money from the electric bills. The most challenging project that I had during the decommissioning was the segmentation of the reactor internals, packaging and moving 
the reactor internals for storage. It took a great deal of planning, not only to do the mechanical work, which we used a high pressure water jet to cut up the internals, but also, and, uh, and set it up remotely, but there were also strong uh, radiation protection controls during the process. And uh, that was the most dose intensive job we had. Because this is mostly demolition, and uh, we, we took safety very seriously, and uh, we had uh, we implemented a very strong safety program throughout the site for our workers. When you're tearing down walls, when you're setting off explosives to demolish buildings and the like, it, it's a very dangerous atmosphere, so you need uh, quite good controls. A good example of that is uh, when we took down the uh, the turbine building, the engineers came to me early on and said. Uh, you know, we'd like to use explosives to take the turbine building down. Th th this was shortly after the attack of 9-11, a couple of weeks after, and there was heightened concern, obviously, in the community about uh, explosives uh, and uh, just uh, anything out of the ordinary, especially at a nuclear power plant. And, and my initial reaction to the engineers was, you know, this is going to be difficult. People, you know, it's going to be hard for people to understand this. removing the radioactive risk. This particular plant on buildings which were cleared of radioactive contamination, they used explosives to take them down. There were, there were enormous clouds of dust, so the question would be raised, is there a radioactive component to the dust? The community advisory panel invited professional radiologists and environmental experts to ensure that it had an unbiased view of these issues. So on the second meeting, we came in and the uh, federal standard of uh, resi for residual radiation, how much is to be left in the ground, um, was uh, 250 microsieverts. Um, and, but we had found government documents where agencies of the federal government were arguing that this was not safe, not protective of public health. That was this phrase. And so we pushed first for 15 millirem, which was what was recommended by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and they would not move on it. Ray was very active in uh, pushing a lower standard for Maine, uh, uh, for Maine Yankee. Radiation standards are changing. They always have changed from the very beginning when people were, when they thought that a safe dose of radiation was one that didn't make your skin too red, which is deadly, I mean, but people didn't know. And over the years, until very recently, the amount of permissible radiation in the occupational standards and in the, in the standards for the general public have gone down, 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 down. To persuade the public that the existing standard of 250 microsieverts was sufficiently safe, Maine Yankee financed and organized meetings with federal experts. We debated them, and then when they wouldn't move, we said, because we investigated what other states were doing, the state of Massachusetts, the state of New York, um, and they were moving to adopt a, not a 15, or excuse me, that would be not a 150, but a um, 100 microsievert standard. And so we came back and we said, okay, you, you will not move to 150? We are now demanding 100. And we began a political campaign, um, a public relations campaign, to push them to that. Before he was appointed Maine's nuclear safety inspector, 
Patrick Dusty had worked for several years at Maine Yankee, so he knew the situation well. I knew where most of the thing was, so I personally felt they could easily meet the 10 milliram standard by setting an administrative limit. And so I, I personally felt that they could easily meet it. His question, or his proposal, prompted us to take a serious look. And when we took a serious look, we realized we could do it. The stipulated norm of 100 microsieverts of residual radiation meant that plant premises and buildings, as well as all materials on the site, had to be inspected for possible radioactive contamination. What was the additional cost, not only in money, but in time? Turned out it, it was uh, completely doable. In fact, I think I called up Ray and told him uh, we're going to do it. When this question of the radiation standard was brought to the Maine State Legislature for consideration to be to you know not just to be an agreement between Friends of the Coast and Maine Yankee but actually to be cast into law we will evaluate uh, this decommissioning to the state standard so that, that's ultimately how it happened after a year-long battle the state of Maine lowered required decontamination levels on the former Maine Yankee site to 100 microsieverts in the soil and 40 microsieverts in the water this new norm made it possible to convert the main Yankee site to any use. Behind us here, uh, on the shoreline, you can see the concrete abutments, the remnants of the riverbank reinforcement uh, that was the site of the main Yankee atomic power station. It has been a learning process. Um, the, it was the, it was the first large-scale decommissioning in the United States. Um, I think that uh, the state's involvement made the process better, and I think it also um, highlighted uh, some of the areas that maybe the federal government wasn't looking close enough at. What you can't see, uh, because of the trees on the riverbank here, um, is just north of us in the river, a independent spent fuel storage installation, uh, which holds all of the burnt uranium fuel that um, Maine Yankee ever created. Uh, from uh, day one, there was no fuel shipped off site. In 2004, a dry storage facility for spent nuclear fuel was built on the main Yankee site. The storage facility covers an area of 12 acres and includes an adjacent building for personnel. The facility includes 60 sealed steel containers that store spent nuclear fuel and four containers that hold high-level waste. Okay, behind me and to the right is the independent spent fuel storage installation. This contains all of the fuel that was ever uh, irradiated at Main Yankee. And um, it amounts to about 900 English tons. We're concerned that the spent fuel will be exposed uh, in the open. Concrete canisters, concrete casks standing, one, two, three, like bowling pins, here they are. It is concerns such as these, the aircraft impact, the potential vulnerability to weapons that led Friends of the Coast to insist that this spent fuel storage facility be surrounded with what we call an earthen berm, mounded earth to protect them. I really don't know what will happen to the fuel. Uh, it is very safely packaged and is being safely and securely stored for now until our Department of Energy 
uh, decides what the appropriate long-term future for the fuel is. Reprocessing uh, hasn't been done in the United States since about 1978. Um, we've gotten a fair amount of spent nuclear fuel primarily sitting in uh, f what we call fuel pools, which are uh, the pools of water that keep them cool, or the, the dry cask storage. If we don't have a place to dispose of it or to store it long term, due to the security concerns uh, and, and just age concerns. I don't think that our government has dealt successfully with where it's going to go. That's why I don't approve of it in the first place. And we've got to do something with it, and at this point in time, reprocessing seems to be our best bet. About 10 miles due south of this site is the Brunswick Naval Air Station, where there are based submarine hunting aircraft. And on one occasion, I observed a tanker aircraft flying one wing down, one wing up, and arcing in a circle at low altitude over Maine Yankee. I feel it, it, that they need to stay here. Um, we haven't come up with a solution. Putting them on railway cars and taking them across the country uh, puts many other people at risk. And uh, I couldn't do that. I, I don't believe we can do that. But with the spent fuel rubs on site, there is always a uh, danger. I said at the very first meeting, representing the town of Wiscasset, that we wanted the highest and best reuse of the main Yankee nuclear power site after it were, was dis decommissioned. What people in this region wanted, um, we expressed as the restoration of the site to what it was before the industrial impact before the main Yankee was uh, built and operated there. So then specifics, details, came out of that. If you travel the state of Maine, you would, it, it would be very difficult for you to find any litter, any paper, any plastic, any, any trash by the side of the roadway or in the woods, or in the fields, because we have that relationship with nature that says we should leave it as clean as we found it. And I think that's a very deeply ingrained uh, standard uh, with the people in this state. Three years into decommissioning in the year 2000, Friends of the Coast came to agreement with Maine Yankee Atomic Power Company on a number of issues to enhancements to improve the environment. The land that you see behind me will never be redeveloped for industrial purposes or for residents or for any other purpose. Maine Yankee Atomic Power Company and Friends of the Coast signed an agreement stipulating that no other nuclear power station would ever be built in the state of Maine and that spent fuel from other reactors would never be imported for disposal at the main Yankee site. And so even though the power plant itself has been decommissioned, they still have a license and there's still a significant quantity of radioactive material on site. And so because of that, we anticipate that there will be state oversight of this facility for many, many years to come. And so because of that, we have uh, the groundwater monitoring, we have the ambient radiation monitoring with thermoluminescent dosimeters, um, and we have flora and fauna monitoring of um, different biota in the, in the surrounding. Maine Yankee received an award from the federal government, from the federal, uh, federal Environmental Protection Agency as this whole thing, this decommissioning, and I can't remember exactly how it was uh, worded that award, but they got to receive the plaque that basically said they did a good job on the site. And 
The president of Maine Yankee at the time, his name was Ted Feigenbaum, told me that the reason they received this is because of all the involvement, not only of the state, but other individuals, like Friends of the Coast, involved in this whole process, and we made it a better product at the end. They are the ones that received the award, but in reality it's everybody, by being involved, made that award possible. I would say that the, the greatest lesson um, or satisfaction came from not being afraid to say, I don't like this, I don't think it's safe, I don't think it's wise, and not being afraid to uh, take part in expressing that. In America and um, in England, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a movement to create uh, objects of beauty uh, by hand, um, called the crafts movement. And they had a practice that I, I think it applies in this case. And, <clears throat> and that is where they would make a piece of furniture of some kind, a table, a chair, or, or even build a house, whatever then the craftsman would put a label with his name and then he would put the magic words this is the best that I can do when I look at the main Yankee site like <clears throat> go out and stand on the hill and look down at the at the uh, grass and the trees where the plant used to stand um, and look at the spent fuel and, and the rest of it, I have to say, this is the best that we could do. Despite a lot of failings, a certain amount of laziness, but when I think about it, I did the best job that I could do. And so did many of my uh, friends in working on this issue. decommissioning itself and then there's the fuel storage That's and, and it's, that yeah. fuel storage is separate yeah. and and but they have recovered on that they've yeah. been getting regular payments from the so the Yankee Oil cost 700 million yes um, and Maine which was three times four times larger or something like that well let me explain that a little bit because exactly. because <clears throat> Yankee Yankee Row started decommissioning um, before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had finished uh, promulgating their rules. There were there's a whole new set of rules. They they decommissioned under rules that had been around since the Second World War, right. and <clears throat> they they basically they ran out of money. They stopped the decommissioning process, 
Then they filed under the new rules, and they also then asked for more money and restarted. And you may remember that Yankee Row was part of the Eisenhower Adams for Peace uh, program. You know, that began in 1957, and the plant was built in '62. And it was one where they took, you know, dignitaries from Asia and Europe to show them American nuclear power. It was a it was a show plant, but it was also an experimental plant. It was the first big one. Everything before that was less than 100 megawatts, and that was thing was 250. It was considered huge. And they, so they did experiments with all kinds of fuel, different. Uh, like stainless steel cladding, zirconium, whatever. They ran different proportions of fuel, um, and they were reckless with the handling of a lot of it. So they had poison in the ground. They had they had radioactivity in the ground around their fuel pits, um, um, spreading downhill toward the uh, Deerfield River. I guess it is comes in at the base of that hill, and. Um, when they restarted decommissioning, they, they just found more and more stuff. And so the cost went up. And, and there's a time <coughs> cost factor too. It took a little bit more than 10 years. And so, you know, every week you're out there, it costs more money. And to retain the, retain the troops, keep moving, cost money. Thank you. So that drove the cost up there. Connecticut Yankee cost almost a billion dollars. It was 900 plus million dollars. And that was a 500 megawatt plant, smaller than uh, Vermont Yankee, I think. So I remember, 550, something like that. They, they hired a contractor, a general contractor, to come in and do the decommissioning. It was Bechtel Corporation. And the guys from Bechtel, Bechtel brought in all kinds of workers. Some of them were familiar with nuclear, some not. Um, they removed, uh, moved and removed big water storage tanks, all kinds of other equipment, um, after they had begun to clean up the site. They disturbed the soil. They released radioactive contamination from under those structures. Um, and the end result was that all of the all of the site survey and all of the cleanup had to be done over again. And Bechtel was fired off the job. Connecticut Yankee undertook to, to contract it itself and bring in minor contractors and do the work. But they basically had a decommissioning twice. I mean, at, at, at the end, basically. So Second time. Maine didn't have subsurface contamination? Maine did, and a hell of a lot of it. Okay. And in fact, you know, it's not a perfect decommissioning. There were things... <clears throat> there's, a, there's a process when, when a reactor is about to melt down, where you simply pump water and dump it on top of the reactor. And that water heats up, and it goes down in the sump, and the pumps pump it back up and on top of the reactor again, you know, and you recircle it, and it keeps getting hotter and hotter. And at a certain point, when the pumps apply suction on that water, it boils. And the pumps are trying to pump steam, and it doesn't work. And so they lose their net positive it's suction head. But anyway, so, so yeah, so they, but, but Maine Yankee had a scheme for overcoming that. They had dug a building 35 feet or 40 feet, down into the ground right next to the containment. And this was called their spray building. The pumps were at the bottom of that building. And then pipes went up to draw water from inside the base of the containment to the pumps, and then they could throw it back up on top. Um, you may know that a pump can throw water a lot further than it draws water. And so the scheme was they're going to provide extra pressure by putting them down in this 35 foot pit. The piping that went through these concrete walls, which were 12 foot thick and more, uh, in that building was highly contaminated. And it was 35 feet down in the ground. Uh, typically with a handheld instrument that they use for radiation detection. detection. Typically, um, 100, 125 pounds uh, per minute 
the, you know the clicks in the Geiger counter? Each one of those is a disintegration. So 100 to 125 disintegrations per minute. Click, 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 click. That piping was 800,000 disintegrations per minute on the inside. They tried to clean it. They used some acid. They tried to, but it really wasn't working in it. They weren't reducing it very much. And they came to the Friends of the Coast with this proposition. We clean it as best we can, we cement it over, and we bury it. In return for that, we'll clean up an acre or more of the surface soil way cleaner than what your uh, cleanup standard is. So we'll remove radiation from where people can access it. If we can leave radiation where people are very unlikely to access it. <coughs> we never made a decision on it. Ultimately, the company <coughs> got it down to somewhere around 200 or 300,000 counts per minute and buried it. And basically told us, tough luck, you know. <laughs> You snooze, you lose, whatever. Uh, they did what they did. So that hot spot is there. It, is anybody going to dig down there? Or is it going to migrate to the surface? I kind of don't think so, but Groundwater. It, it leaves it less than a perfect decommissioning. And every single decommissioning is less than a perfect decommissioning. I, uh, I had a friend tell me that an entire truckload of welding rod, and I'm a welder, entire truckload of welding rod was dumped in a construction site dump when the plant was being built because it came through and it didn't have the certification numbers on it. I said, where is it? <laughs> well, he, there was an approximate location. I told the company about it. They said, never happened. We never had a construction site dump. It was at the local flea market looking through old magazines and photographs, and here were two eight by ten aerial photos of the construction site dump. So we took them to the advisory panel meeting in front of the press and everybody and said, how about these? Anyway, they dug, they dug a trench about 900 feet long and almost 15 or 16 feet deep, the yard wide, all the way across the corner of the site, very neatly missing the precise location of that dump. And when we pointed out that it was actually closer to the transmission towers on the photo, they said they couldn't dig there because the transmission towers were grounded with big electric lines that ran out in the ground around them. That's convenient. Yeah, and it was also, yeah. And the state wouldn't back us up on it. So somewhere out there, there's a construction dump full of PCBs, lead, mercury, and whatever the hell welding rock flux is. Um, but, you know, there it is. So we had a lot, of, a lot of things that were never resolved that we fought with them about. But, like the man said, you know, we gave it our best job. We did, it, we did a good job. Um, yeah. I'll try to answer the next question very quickly. Could you say a few words about Shumlin, your take on Shumlin as far as his awareness is, you had said that the last year of the plan is the most dangerous, but your, from your perspective, could you, could you say a few words about what you think about his knowledge and his commitment? Look, you know, Governor Shumlin's willing to listen. We met with him um, about a year ago, Jake Smith, who's the, or Jake uh, Stewart, who's the um, vice president of New England Coalition, and I went and we met with him. Um, he heard what we had to say. He didn't agree with us, he didn't follow us. But, um, you know, he's, he's a layman. And he's, a, he's a, a good politician. Probably was a very good representative. And maybe a good governor, I don't know. But he's a layman, and I, I think his problem is cronyism is a strong word. But there's political payback to the people that supported him that were now in positions around him. You know, they're his pals, the head of the Department of Public Service, his, his personal 
manager, or whatever she's called now, Liz Miller, for example. They're very nice people, but they don't know squat about this issue. And they are also unwilling to take any advice or information from outside. Um, and so, on different occasions, on the different dockets we've been involved in so far, and this one, I think, they've walked into traps. And uh, this, this commingling of the fund for site restoration and the decommissioning fund, I think, is one of them. Those, those are two completely different things. They should have never allowed that. You mean greenfield and yeah. money yeah. And, and decommissioning? Yeah, there's two different things. And regulated by two different agencies and two different levels of government. You know, one is federal, one is state. It, but anyway, my sense is he's badly advised. I think the state's attorneys are arrogant, um, kind of young know-it-alls. You can't tell them a damn thing, and um, especially if you're if you're not an attorney, if you're um, a pro se representative, you know they 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 don't hear it. Um, Sarah Hoffman, who was head of the Department of Public Service under uh, the previous governor, Douglas. Yeah, I would like to forget his name. Uh, well, <laughs> she actually represented. New England coalition's interest in a lot of dockets and, and negotiated things that we had brought to the table and got agreement from the company. They would never admit that, you know, but we would raise the issues and then they would appear in the memorandum of understanding. And um, the present group, we kind of we kind of have a patronizing sort of. Uh, approach from them. I think it's dangerous. Always. You know. uh, my grandpa said you can learn something from the dumbest of people. And I wish they would apply that to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, anyway, that's just my attitude about it. Thank you. Uh, sir? Uh, well, first, regarding Governor Shumlin, the problem is he has no technical background. His background is running a student travel agency. That's the family business. But, but my question is, uh, uh, are you aware of any valid reason for waiting 50 to 60 years to decommission Vermont Yankee? Neither valid nor legal. Okay. The company says that if you wait 20 years, just to 2032, that they will have raised like a billion dollars and there will be a nice, comfortable cushion. You know? Well, they have no interest in the cushion because they're administering a public trust. And a trustee of a public trust is not allowed to enrich themselves at the expense of the trust. So, you know, they can get some profit, but they can't get egregious profit. So, 60 years or 50 years, I can't imagine it. And what Exelon Corporation um, owns two nuclear plants in Illinois, they're called the Zion Nuclear Plant. They put them in a safe store <clears throat> many years ago, well actually the previous owners put them in a safe store, and Exelon purchased them along with the package. And what they found was that it was costing so much money to maintain the plant in safe store that their decommissioning funds weren't growing at all in the, the invested funds. In fact, I think they were actually shrinking. Um, so they created a company to decommission them, quick and dirty. They actually, they actually created a company and transferred a title to it, which is a very scary proposition. Um, but they've gone to, to uh, prompt decommissioning to decon. And uh, I think the tag, price tag for the two of them is around 900 million. And both of them are plants larger than, and more contaminated, I think, than, uh, than DY. So, um, I think, personally, I'm, just in my, I'm about to write an uh, op-ed piece on this. I think, 
energy is really not a very good manager. It's really not a very well-run business. They made several bad business decisions with respect to Vermont Yankee, the first one being to buy the damn thing. Um, and, and it was the result of a kind of arrogance. You know, they really didn't appreciate uh, the good work that Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Corporation did with Ross Barkhurst at the helm. Um, but they did a pretty good job of running that plant. There were certain um, maintenance things that were, had fallen in arrears. But they, they did the best they could. They could not make money at it. And they didn't dare to do a 5% power uprate even though the state nuclear engineer at the time was, was complaining to the uh, Department of Public Service and the Public Service Board that they should do a, a power upgrade to increase their profits. And then they looked at it, they said, no, we're going to bust our equipment, we're not going to make any money doing that. It's not practical. Um, Entergy, ew, you know, 20%. We can do that, why not? So it's a bad business decision. So, so, um, so was uh, running it, you know, beyond the court challenge. And uh, yes, Ray, as I look around, <coughs> there's a there's a lot of doers here, and, and I'm, there's folks here that I think are thinking. So, what do we do next? What can I do? What's the next step here? Oh, that kind of doer. Okay. Like, I'll get involved if I know what I need to do. Doers on the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> or what, what kind of leverage we really have. Well, do, you, do you speak to that a little bit? Is, what, well, is, I think the crux. Do we have any at all? Do we gain any? We have leverage at the Vermont Public Service Board, which is the last stop, I think, for any formal proceeding before the state. Last stop. Next stop is, could be as far as 20 years down the road or more before there's a, 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 a real hearing at the federal level. The, the mercy of the NRC. Well, you know, we incurred major debt fighting the fight at the Public Service Board. It's been five years. At one point, we had two attorneys working the case, and, um, and it's been thousands of hours. So we're in the hole. We need to be out of it in order to move on anything else. We basically, basically, New England Coalition has its hands tied because of, of debt and the prospects of incurring more <coughs> as we go forward. So we need money. And if people don't have money, they can ask their friends and family for money. That's the way it's usually done uh, in this kind of thing. Uh, we need that kind of support. Um, that's one, it's a major one, and it's very important. Uh, sounds crass. Um, sure not. I mean, there's a young man that uh, working for the Toxic Action Coalition, and they go around training community groups um, and how with how the process works, the political process, and so on, regulatory process, and also how to run an organization, how to get, do fundraising. And a one young man, 20 plus years old, 22, 23, 4 said that he looked at the whole environmental movement and he thought that the best thing he could do with his young life was to go out and raise money to put these organizations uh, on track and to help them out. So it's, you know, it's a very, it's a real and it's a very significant thing. The other thing that we need is uh, we need some letters of interest from people who might be willing to serve on our board, which is Presently undermanned, um, we have two people on the board um, who have served more than 30 years, um, and then we have a bunch of people who have served about, I think, at max five. I don't know when. When did when did you come on, Ned? 2006. Four, four years. Four years. So, and and so we have four years, five years, and so on. The in between stretch, you know, we forgot to renew ourselves as we were going along as old timers. And so we kind of lost a generation. The medium half-life isotopes. <laughs> the, the, uh, there's, You're a long-term isotope. There's three old people 
we, we're all the same age within a year of each other. There's Paul Blanche, a nuclear engineer that's been around and we've heard of him. There's Mary Lampert who works on Pilgrim. She's just a one woman, total dynamo. Nobody can work with her because you can't keep up with her. And, uh, and as sweet as she is, but we're all within a year of each other, you know. And so we had to dub our, our trio. We were all working on Seabrook. So we are the gray neutrons. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we need people that might be willing to serve on the board. And the way to do that is to, is to write a letter of interest that says, hey, I'm interested on in the board and I, have, I, can, I can give this kind of uh, ability. I can, you know, I can bake like hell or fix your car, whatever it may be. Or I can, I can help raise money. Uh, or I can bring in my, or I can do my own money. Um, but we need help with thinking through these issues. Going into this decommissioning, this last year of, of operation, it's big, complicated stuff. It's, it's more than just a few of us can handle, and we need input from, from everybody. And there's no reason that a person can't be a board member of more than one organization, even in the same field. So, yes ma'am. What is the time frame here? When will the Public Service Commission part of this be over? The, the, probably in January, but the, the, the Public Service Department asked the board not to issue a decision until December the 11th. And they didn't say that their negotiations would be finished on December 11th. They said they would report back to the board. Uh, on December 11th. They may be completed. Those guys may have come to something and it may be good. We don't know. Um, but um, my intention, and I'm the pro se rep for New England Coalition, my intention is to complain no matter what they do. Um, because I anticipate that they are not going to satisfy the concerns of all of the parties. You know, they'll, they're going to pick and choose, they're going to have their one way through this. That's what I anticipate. And I think that the board, as a matter of respect, owes it to give some kind of equal weight to the arguments of all the parties. If there's equal evidence, you know, they cannot just throw out all this work to say, you know, Governor Shumlin has come down off the mountain, he has these two tablets of stone, there it is. You know. yeah. so, so anyway, so I figure December 11th, if they get an agreement on December 11th, Who, who's in all that? likely the, if, the the, if, the pub, if the Public Service Board receives a memorandum of understanding between the governor and, and Entergy on the 11th, they will have to send notice to the parties. I think very likely what they will do if that happens, they'll, they'll ask the parties for comment, which is a way of, it's an informal path through the parties' right to represent themselves. Just comments. Give us comments on it. They give them comments. They say, fine, thanks a lot, and then they do whatever they want. But they'll probably do that, and it'll be a couple of days, and they have to give us a reasonable amount of time to comment three, four days, you know, and right away we're looking at Christmas Eve. Yeah. You know, so I'm thinking, ah, this, this is going to go until January, that's what I'm thinking, before there's a, a, a public service board decision. Um, and they will have to um, give their approval or disapproval or a rubber stamp or whatever. They're going to have to do something with this to end the case that we have right now. Uh, yes. I'll offer an observation and a suggestion. The observation is, as I understand from the film, uh, there were quite a few people in Wisconsin and the Wisconsin area who were, were opponents of the plan. Now, uh, in mm -hmm. the case of uh, in the case of Berman, that is uh, not true. Hence, my suggestion: you folks have the expertise to uh, facilitate a uh, more timely decommissioning, which of course would be to uh, Vernon's advantage as well. And it may be possible to, uh, to get some people to work with you by, mm. by, by presenting it from that angle. That it's in everyone's interest to get, a, to get a timely decommissioning, and you folks have the expertise that Vernon folks don't have, as they have never been involved in uh, 
I am opposing anything down there. Um, well, there's some hopeful signs from Vernon. Uh, they're representative to the legislature. It's kind of a muffin of a guy, but he was on the, on the panel that was sponsored by the Commons newspaper, and here we have a little community discussion. What's his name? Representative Mike Hebert. Yeah. He said, he said right out, he said, I don't want my grandchildren to have to deal with this decommission. Mm -hmm. hmm. you know? He said, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I have to weigh the interest of the town, blah, 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 blah. But then he said, I don't want my grandchildren to deal with this. Um, the most realistic, solid statement. You know? So I have to hope there. I will tell you that. You saw in the film where we had an agreement with May Yankee, our group did, about a 10-4 standard for decommissioning. But we took it to the legislature to get it embodied in law. They fought us on that. And they, they shipped busloads of workers up there to testify that the 10-4 standard would slow down the job and people would lose their jobs, blah, blah, blah. The town of Wiscasset was told that there might be a gas-fired plant waiting in the wings. They actually got a letter from Stone and Webster saying, we might be interested. It was bogus. But they offered that day to the town. The town hired one of the biggest law firms in the state to fight us because they wanted a dirtier, quicker decommissioning so they could get the gas. So, we, so there, you know, I mean, we, we had the, the, the town officially saying, you know, don't do the, the better cleanup. Just do a regular cleanup. Mm -hmm. It's good. So I, I, think the, I think it's an illusion. I mean, <coughs> we had about 12 people on the, on the Friends of the Coast board, and the two of them were from Wisconsin. Um, but, you know, no, I think it was very much like Vernon. I think, I think any, I think what sociologists, psychologists have found in the past looking at this is people who live very close to a nuclear plant like it. People who live a little further away, they don't like it so much. And people who live at a comfortable 10 miles, they hate it. And, and that it is a psychological trick because you cannot live next to one of those and worry about it. You'll yeah. go nuts. You, know, you either have to have to accept it or move, and um, so that's what we find. And we find that any time that we look at, at voting, we were totally astounded that one third of the people in the town of Wisconsin voted to close the plant. One third. You know, statewide we got forty-one point nine percent. In Wisconsin we got like thirty-three well, percent. Pretty cool. They were depending on it for ninety-five percent of their tax base. Yeah. You know, so it's mixed, really. Yeah, and I have plus which you know you're asking you're asking me that question, and I really don't have a good answer. I think that's an answer that people here, who know people here, know the people they're working with, and know the people that work at the plant, and it, you really have to come to that yourself. You know, how do we how how are we gonna present ourselves in a way that, and here's my book, you know, convincing and credible to your opponents. You know, my measure of this is what kind of reception I get from the nuclear industry, which is generally fairly positive because they know I'm not religious about it. I just don't agree with them on the facts. And so we can talk, you know. And I've many, many times sat in broken bread with nuclear industry executives and we've talked about these issues, you know. And I love to stick it to them. I mean, it's not like, my, one of my favorite lines is, okay, you want to build a nuclear plant? Sure. Within your retirement funds, executive guys, there's enough money to build one. Go ahead and build it. Build it with your own money. They're like, oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah.
I'm sorry, that's just my, my sense of humor. next to your house, too. <laughs> what about thinking outside the box? Is there any, if, if they choose the safe store and if Shumlin goes along with it and gets a little money for Vernon or whatever, I mean, at what point can we take back control of the game? I mean, would it be Vermont decides to go to energy and say, okay, we're going to condemn the place and buy it from you and have some judge tell us what it's worth and get the commission, the, the decommissioning fund back into, I mean, sort of be the owner and the person in charge of the show and, and it, it even raise bond funds or go to Massachusetts District Commission say, hey, your water sheds at risk, your quad and red fork. Let's shut this thing down and at not be point, hostage to this risk. I got you. At one point, we were better friends with Maine Yankee Tire Power Company than, were, than we were with the state of Maine. And you know, we 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 had uh, postcard uh, petition type things asking for the governor to enforce a cleaner cleanup standard and uh, to do health studies. And you know, we were just we had opened up every single portal we could to harass him and, and and even bringing that bill to the legislature. You know. Um, we had our uh, we had our opponents at the at the state level. At one point, I sent the governor an email, and I said, "We have volunteers out this week with nothing to do. Is there any reason that I shouldn't have them out on U.S. Route One with leaflets declaring the Wiscasset waste site?" as the Angus King Memorial Wayside. <laughs> he called my home and screamed at me over the telephone for about four minutes. I've been the most of it. Just as going on, you know. And I said, I you know, appreciate your sentiments, Governor, but let me just tell you, we feel this very strongly here, and I didn't know any other way to get his attention. He said, all right, give me a list of them. Give me a list of ten things. What's your ten top priority? Send me a list. Yeah. So we didn't. Of course, he didn't do much with it. But um, yeah, you know, when when the company said no to fifteen, we said ten. <coughs> it's a, it's a, I have a lot of ethnic threads, and it's a kind of a way that we tend to bargain. You know, never mind West Bank. Get out of Israel altogether. No, I mean, we just have, anyway, so that's what I recommend. I recommend developing a position that's a reasonable, tenable position, run it out with the community, argue it out, you know, and then promulgate it and hang on to it. Say this is what the people want. Pete, so, Pete's got a question back here. I, sure. was, I was just curious. You said that energy decommissioned that main Yankee. Did they we had it? energy managers. When when energy became famous uh, throughout the nuclear industry, when they uh, took over a plant uh, on the southern uh, Mississippi River called the River Bend plant, it was a total wreck, a total failure, and wasting high maintenance, and just had all kinds of bad scores. And then our state, they turned it around totally in one year, and. Uh, and the industry was gone. What a miracle! But you know, we felt that it was paper. They papered it over. The problem. But Maine Yankee had, was in such deep water that they wanted to bring in a couple managers from Energy, and so they hired them in. The the one that remained for decommissioning was the guy in the film, now retired, and I consider him a friend of mine. And uh, he, in turn, when they were doing decommissioning, brought in his cronies. From energy, you know, they hired a bunch of more people on temporary basis, so it became really an energy project. Yeah. Why would they want to get it done? Why, I, I really don't understand why they. You say that I mean the idea that it costs more to maintain. I tell you, ten million dollars a year to maintain the safe store. Maybe twenty. Then, then how can you grow your fund? And how can they even justify spending our really fund? Risky it's our fund. It's our money. These guys, well. The, the, that the fund itself is administered by an, an investment firm, and, it's, and uh, they are not allowed to invest in very risky uh, stock. It's all pretty conservative stuff. Uh, and they, you know, like I said, I'm not a businessman. I have a hard time balancing my checkbook. They run the numbers, 
and somehow in there they see some margin where, where they're going to make money. I'd say so. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I don't think it's possible. I think they made bad decisions buying the plant, bad decisions um, doing the power up rate. Um, they made a number, passed a number of bad decisions. Um, you know, they, they decided um, prior to the MRTHA ruling uh, at federal court that they were going to refuel the plant one more time, and that was like, it's just, a, it's just, there's just a hundred million dollars down the toilet, you know. Um, they were right, uh, sort of. Um, there's still about 30 million worth of that that they have to burn up this, this coming year. But, um, you know, they're risk takers. They're very aggressive. Um, they feel they can't be hurt by this no matter what happens. Parent company. I will say that it's in the memorandum of understanding in any order of the sale case, the initial case, that they are liable. And the parent company is liable. They signed on. They said, yeah, you know, we're, we're back in this and we're liable. Whether they can be held to that or not, that's, I don't know. You know it's going to be a fight. And, uh, you know, I don't have anything to offer you except a fight. And, and believe me, I didn't start it. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm just saying it's covered. But, uh, yeah. But anyway, we would appreciate it very much if... If you you know you all would consider joining in the think tank such as it is, we don't think much, but we do have some fun. Um, and in helping New England Coalition to figure out, you know, what steps we take next. Um, we want to raise our public profile. We've been in the trenches. Nobody knows what the hell we're doing. We're in the court. Um, we want to bring in some um, educated speakers, January, February, um, and engage in more discussion with people that know more about specifics of certain areas than I do, certainly. Um, and uh, so we'd like people to be participating in that. Um, the governor and uh, the, your local legislators, state, you need to know that your real concern, whatever your concerns may be coming out of this, out of tonight even, that your real concern about how this decommissioning is going to go, your real concern that the regulators keep their eyes on the ball when, through this next year. This is a very dangerous year. And uh, they, they need to know. I mean, you can look at the information yourself. Go to the NRC website. And very easy, nrc.gov. And look at the information. I think you will agree, probably, when you get through with it, that storing it in a water-filled tank up in the air is not a good idea. It needs to be moved as quickly as possible. One reason, by the way, in this tank, which is vulnerable, and I think I explained that before, is that once a Oxidation reaction starts in that tank. Once the fuel becomes exposed and overheats, and you start this glowing and popping and snapping, which you cannot put out with water, the entire mass of fuel can become involved. So all five cores can light up. What it is. In dry cask, where you have what, however many assemblies, 68, 70, whatever they put in there, there's no way that you can envision anything spreading from one cask to another. You know, you have to think about it. six or eight or 10 or 12 feet or whatever there is between casks and then a stainless steel container and then a one inch thick steel wall and then 20 inches of cement and then another inch thick steel wall. And you have to try to think about how can this, something going on here, get over to another cask. You know, it's almost impossible. It isn't, for me it's impossible. Um, and so, so the great difference really is, is it's kind of like when you're camping and you break out a fire, you know, there's almost no way it's going to relight. If you push it back together, yeah. Sometimes they make a, I have that feeling that we have to stop, we have a fire down there that we just can't put out. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 
should be much more scary than the modifier. <coughs> well, it will be going. One argument we made with May Andy, and they seemed to buy into it, was that if they if, if they incorporated the community sentiment, if they if they reached out to the community and they and we, we were able to be involved, if they cleaned up to the community standards the best job they could on site restoration, they could brag about that forever. And if they wanted to build another nuclear power plant, that would be a much more telling argument than saying we did it cheap and dirty. Yeah. We came in under budget. Well, all right, maybe, you know. but it's not nearly as strong an argument as saying we left those people satisfied. Energy is putting out those kinds of waves to the town of Vernon. <laughs> Mr. Hebert repeated some of them. He said they want to leave with their heads high and the flag waving. So, okay, part of that is people like yourselves talking directly to the king. Peace with honor. They want yeah. peace with honor. Write letters to their board of directors and suggest that the board of directors may not want to leave a big black smirch up here in Vermont. Invite them to come, invite them to come skiing. Energy, the, the, the Louisiana Super Corporation, or do you mean the, the, the local man? No, you have to talk to the top because, I mean, and on a person to person level, you talk to the site manager right here right, right. in Vernon. Um, there is an intermediary, which is Energy Nuclear Operations, which is located in New York and the White Plains, I guess, and they, they run all the energy nuclear plants. But that's. Those are just mid-level managers. You either, either talk to the board of directors and the top people and reason with them on your own terms, um, or talk to the people here and reason with them on your own terms. You know, what we want to, I, I would say, for me, I would say, I don't want to get less of a clean up here than the people got um, at Maine Yankee or Connecticut. You know, we deserve a strict cleanup standard. We deserve to have you guys packed up and out of here in a reasonable period of time. Just like them. <coughs> Let me ask one question. I'm sorry to bring up something else, but this is all related. Sure. Where where is the in the best of all possible worlds with no big federal repositories? This idea that you're gonna pack up and go away. Where is all, what's the best possible scenario for where that fuel, I mean, literally, is going to end up? Itself. Yeah, they take it out of the, out of the pool and put it in dry cask. I mean, wasn't it just a few years ago that the industry was saying that that's the new plan, that fuel stays at the proprietary well, sites? And, you know, and there's a lot of people that have the attitude that, that somehow the people in this area benefited from the plant, so they should host the fuel forever. Or at least until there's some kind of you know, deep space warp hole to throw it in, and and um, I mean that was my friend Andy Burt on the on the film. She was saying I just don't feel right about sending it somewhere else. Yeah, there's that sentiment. Um, but then there's also the practical question of what that's actually going to happen, and then then you pick them um, as Deb Cap said in the meeting uh, last night. You know, you pick from the worst, least worst of the possible choices. Now you're a whole bunch of worse choices and then you're trying to pull out the one that's the least worst. The, there's, um, what do you think is the least worst? I think the least worst is the consolidated storage. Um, there's a lot of unused military bases um, where you can provide security, where it wouldn't be in a residential zone, uh, where it would be out on a huge, humongous uh, expanse of concrete and where you would have on a not a train plane. people. Hmm? Not, not right in a floodplain. A foot no, well, floodplain. that's another thing, too. Uh, Ned and I were talking down uh, here. Uh, this site is probably not big enough to really comfortably, I say comfortably, have with lots of space around it. Store all the fuel that's got to come out of that in cash. It's, it's 100 acres, but it's a long, narrow strip. So, every bit of it is floodplain. Well, so there might be, every bit of it, there might be a gravel pit 
Yes, there's Sasmo's or a quarry or something somewhere in the area that would not be prime residential where it could be put. I think what's going to happen, uh, my my best guess for what's going to happen is is um, consolidated storage at a military base either in New York or Massachusetts. Uh, and maybe the old Fort Devon site again. I don't know. Um, but that's what they're talking about among the regulators uh, and out there in the industry is a consolidated site someplace. Um, they are desperate. Um, we had extended discovery at, at Maine Yankee, and so I was in a discovery room of all with a billion documents, right? And I could ask to have anything copied. I don't want to have copied. Um, but I did steal one and, and uh, went out in my shoe. Huh. And what, what a TV. Well, what it was, and it, and it got me. <coughs> Somehow, miraculously, the, the uh, Friends of the Earth in Britain found out about it, and then they put it on British TV, and then it got back to the United States. And then, but uh, basically, all the Yankee companies have teamed together in a plan with British Nuclear Fuels to ship the fuel to Britain, which has, we have laws against exporting it to start with, but, but they, Britain has laws against accepting waste for permanent storage. But the plan was to ship it to Britain to condition, that was the term, condition the fuel, and then when we got storage, they would ship it back. That was the plan. And Temporary. They were going to transfer title on the high seas. It was like mind-boggling. Our Senator George Mitchell was one of the people that was deeply involved in putting this scheme together. They're going to ship out of Portsmouth. And, uh, and so it blew up and it got in the news big time, and that was really the end of it. I think primarily it ended because it, economically it wasn't feasible. Um, but they were desperately desperate to do something with it. Right now, the, uh, the move is on to rehabilitate the Yucca Mountain project. When I was at Yucca Mountain in 2001 or 2002, we did an engineering tour and I was talking to the Stone and Webster contractors out there. I said, so tell me, what's the scenario? The fuel comes in on a train, and then what? And they said, well, that part remains to be <laughs> developed. <laughs> they, had, they had dug tunnels, you know, they had a they had a used tunnel digging machine for sale there for $60 million. They dug tunnels all through this mountain, and they put in test modules, which were electrically heated, which is not, not an accurate thing. But, but they had no plan, nothing laid out, for what happens when the train gets there. You know, I said, do you, do you take the, the casts out of the shipping containers, and open them up, and then put them into casks that are supposed to last 10,000 years? Mm -hmm. Or do you put the whole cask in a cask that's going to last 10,000 years? You know, what, how do you do it? And they said, that hasn't been worked out. And, the, and, and have you worked out, like when you have those five or six different materials, and then you're going to encase them, how do they react over time? Do they have like, you know, bimetal reactions and things like that. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like, it's mind-boggling. There's a super pure copper um, that they alloy. I forget the name of it. They were going to use for the end of these casts. And they they took a big disc of this and they hung it on a, on a tripod or some kind of a platform in the salt surf uh, down in North Carolina on the Outer Bank somewhere, and they hung it out there, and it was sitting there for eight or ten years, and it was as shiny as the day they put it out there. Didn't tarnish at all, you know. And so they said, this is the stuff that's going to, we're going to make the ends of these canisters, storage canisters, out of this copper, because it's like a last yeah. Some wise guy said, what do you think that the design temperature of this cast is going to be? You know? And they said, well, it's probably in the range of 190 to 195 degrees you know, Fahrenheit. That's great. Heated up a bunch of salt water to that temperature. 
put a disc of this copper in there and it dissolved in a matter of days. So, and it's all good fun. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you very much.